in the operating room right now, so we're not going to wait for them. Um, today we'd like to welcome back Dr. Anthony Hartzler. Most of you in this room um, know him, have worked with him. He's uh, specializing in transplant medicine and infectious disease and has been a uh, crucial consultant for the Transplant Center in issues of infectious disease. This issue has come up in the past, but uh, has always needed uh, readdressing and uh, looking at it uh, closer. And I, and I think since your last talk, quantiferon gold has been used widespread and with much confusion by some. So uh, That's going to get cleared up yeah, today. So without further ado. Yeah, I didn't pay him to say that. Actually, I have a whole bunch of stuff about quantifieron in today's talk um, because I get lots of questions. So this is primarily um, what I'm doing for the transplant program when I'm not on transplant medicine and seeing cases just like this that you all send to my clinic. Um, so this is a 53-year-old man with hepatitis C, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma being evaluated for liver transplant, and probably by the time he comes to me, either listed or close to it. Um, he has no pulmonary symptoms and no history of TB exposure, but did vacation in Mexico a few years ago. Um, PPD is positive at 13 millimeters. Quantifiron is positive, and these are his LFTs. As you can see, they're all about two to three times, well, the AST and ALT about two times upper limit of normal. Um, Alcfos 179, total Billy 1.2, so close to normal. Chest x-ray is done and is negative, and on CT chest, you can't really tell this from the, from the single cut, but this is a pulmonary nodule right here. Uh, this is the five millimeter nodule that's the largest one, and there's a few other scattered nodules but really, the three that, that are listed are the only three, so it's not like a big nodular infiltrate. Okay, so then the patient is sent to my clinic for management, and um, I think this talk is going to be just a bit short, so um, what would y'all advocate doing with this patient other than sending him to me? <laughs> So, so we'll say, just, just to say, and I didn't put this on the slide, I think for visual purposes, but the CT chest is, the, is not the first one. These nodules have been seen over time, and they're stable. So these are um, old nodules, perhaps calcified. So these don't seem to be active disease at this point. So just to say this, if, if you see these nodules over time, they're, they're probably granulomas and we'll talk about, but this looks like latent tuberculosis um, based on that. And so, and, and again, that's the majority of what I'm seeing sent over is, is going to end up being diagnosed with latent tuberculosis. So then the question is what to do with somebody who's got LFT abnormalities, a sick liver, do you treat them with isoniazid um, before they go to transplant? Dr. Hartzler, for those of us who don't look at CAT scans, what, is there something distinguishing about that little white blob over all the rest of the white blob? <laughs> yes, there, there is. The distinguishing feature, which you can't see on here, is that if you, so these vessels and airways, if you, if you scan up and down, they continue, okay. whereas this thing is a little blip that's just in a couple of cuts, showing you that it's a little round nodule versus, versus a, a vessel which keeps going. Um, and you can't tell that from this, so you have to take the radiologist's word for it. In the lung, right, right. So there shouldn't be. Yeah. Okay. So so let's review um, just some simple stuff that I that I hope will be useful for everybody. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the cause of TB. Obviously, this only comes from humans. So that um, you know many other species have animal reservoirs or environmental reservoirs, but tuberculosis is only from humans. It's transmitted through the airborne route. Um, so you've got, a, you've got a sick patient here with a cavity. They're coughing out. What they actually cough out is droplets containing tuberculosis. And in order to become infected, these droplets are coughed into the environment. And if this, if this guy breathes in the droplets, 
they actually get stuck in the upper airway and in the bronchi and don't cause any infection. So they're cleared by the, by the immune system and by mucociliary clearance. In order for him to get infected, these droplets have to be coughed out. They have to stay in the air until the, the fluid evaporates from the droplet and leaves what's called a droplet nucleus. And that droplet nucleus, when it's breathed in, will go all the way to the alveolus where it can become infective. Um, so just to say, when you have a hospitalized patient that you know has TB or think has TB, the correct thing to do for infection control, first of all, you put them in an infection in a, um, in a TB isolation room. One of the things that that provides is air changes. So these droplets are removed from the room before they have a chance to become nuclei. And so probably even if the guests are not using proper masks, they're not going to get infected because of the room itself. Um, at, at TCID, the tuberculosis hospital, what they'll do to interview patients is actually just go outside. Everybody takes off their mask. Um, they swear they've been doing this for decades, and no one's ever been infected. So that, that does seem to be effective. In terms of the masks that you wear, the uninfected person needs to wear the N95 mask, which is capable of filtering out these tiny particles. Um, the, the person with TB, if you're going to put a mask on them, they should have a regular surgical mask to stop droplets. So they're, again, they're not producing the droplet nuclei, so they don't need the N95. And what happens if you put that on them is they cough. And then N95 mask, first of all, it doesn't fit right to begin with. But it pops off when they cough, and all the droplets go out around it. Um, OK, so again, to be infected, these, these um, droplet nuclei need to make it to the alveolus. Once they're in the alveolus, they replicate. Initially, if you've never been infected before, they replicate pretty much unchecked. They're able to evade the immune system. And they may disseminate throughout the body in this early stage. The, some of the areas that they really like to go to are bone, kidneys, central nervous system, and lymph nodes. Um, and so again, this can happen in, in healthy patients who are initially infected. At a cellular level, what happens, the mycobacterium is phagocytosed by macrophages in the alveolus. Um, but the macrophage actively escapes killing. So what should happen is these lysosomes sh should fuse with the phagosome and kill the bacteria, but the tuberculosis actively evades this process. And so they're in there happily dividing. Um, after several weeks, cell-mediated immune response develops. So this T helper type 1 cell comes along. What few bacteria have been killed, the antigens are displayed on the surface of this macrophage. The T cell recognizes those antigens and sends a signal to the macrophage to activate it. Once the, the macrophage is activated, then it does a much better job of doing this intracellular killing. In addition to killing the bacteria, the lymphocyte, the T helper lymphocyte, also calls with chemokines additional cells in, so additional macrophages to help to control the infection, and also additional T lymphocytes. And that ends up building this granuloma. OK, so if you have a brisk immune response and few bacteria, what you end up with is granuloma formation. And inside this granuloma, these bacteria oftentimes are contained but never effectively killed. And, it, and it, you end up in a standoff between the immune system and the bacteria. So they don't escape. They don't make you sick. You're completely ah. asymptomatic. But they can't be killed. Um, and they can actually stay in this state. In this, the, there can be live bacteria inside these granuloma for many decades. If you, have, if you have a lot of bacterial replication and a brisk immune response, you get what we think of as typical active tuberculosis, which is very inflammatory. Um, this is an immunocompetent patient that we had last month. On the chest x-ray, this was read as normal initially. But in the left upper lung field, you can see there's this round consolidation. And on chest CT, there's a cavity inside it. Um, so this patient ended up ruling in with active tuberculosis. So, the, cavitary, the cavity formation and tissue necrosis uh, occurs in large part because of the inflammatory immune response and not because of any virulence factor of the tuberculosis itself. If you have many bacteria and a weak immune response, the tuberculosis can disseminate throughout the body, resulting in miliary tuberculosis. It's, if you look at this x-ray, 
you can uh, kind of imagine or see these tiny, tiny dots that are described as looking like a grain called millet. I, don't, I guess we don't really see a lot of millet in, in 2015. But anyway, it's a little grain. Um, it's, it's also described as looking like there's tons of BBs throughout the chest. And it's diffuse. Doesn't really look anything like um, cavitary lesions. So, so again, with very little inflammation, very little immune response, and a lot of bacteria replicating unchecked, what you get is disseminated or miliary TB. So those are kind of the three outcomes that can come from initial infection, depending on the host. And again, so these granulomas contain live bacteria that may persist for many decades. And as cellular immune uh, response weakens for whatever reason, the simplest being just advanced age, um, but others would be immunosuppression. As that happens, then people can convert from having these granulomas or what we call latent TB. They can convert into um, active TB, either the typical active TB with necrosis and cavitation or disseminated TB, again, depending on how much immune response they get. Can I take a quick question? On sure. Right. It implies that. We'll talk a little bit more about the definitions coming up here. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure to clear that up. So when you, when you go to figure out what's going on, so the patient that we saw, you might want to ask for additional epidemiologic ah. clues. Um, and I bring this up because this can be a little bit tricky. Um, so known exposures would be, you know, did your mother have TB? Um, history of travel, history of being in jail or a homeless shelter. And, and you know, don't forget employees of these places. And then healthcare exposure, are you a physician who got coughed on in the emergency department by someone with TB? So I think when I've seen patients, a lot of times the trainees will miss some of these things um, in large part because of, you know, we know that this could happen decades ago. And so when they go ask the patient, they'll say, you know, um, have you traveled recently? Patient says no, and then they come and tell me, well, the patient has no TB risk factors. And then I go in to see the patient, and they don't speak English. They're from Mexico. Um, so and <laughs> you laugh. That has, that has actually happened. So it's, it's a history of travel or being outside the United States that could be decades and decades ago. It could be when they were a child. Um, sometimes people will say, you know, no known TB exposures. And then when you ask, you say, have you been in touch with anyone with TB? They say no. And you say, what about when you were a child? Oh, yeah, my, um, my mother was treated for pulmonary tuberculosis when I was a child. So, you do have to reach pretty back in history, pretty far back. Um, these things I think we all know. So typical tuberculosis is going to be pulmonary. So the symptoms will be cough, hemoptysis, pleuritic chest pain if the cavity is in the periphery. Um, constitutional symptoms, fevers, chills, night sweats, and weight loss. And sometimes these will be pretty subtle. And you kind of have to go back before the symptoms of, before the pulmonary symptoms or symptoms related to the infected organ, did you have any constitutional symptoms? Uh, for disseminated TB, um, this can be much more subtle. So, so TB does disseminate throughout the body. It can infect any organ and any organ system. And so the symptoms can be completely varied depending on where it is. Um, for, for patients with disseminated tuberculosis, that presentation can be pretty subtle. So in a, in a transplant patient who might have disseminated TB, the things that you would look for is failure to thrive, so a patient that's just losing weight and not doing well and doesn't really have any focal symptoms. And fever of unknown origin is also a fairly common presentation. So when you see those in a transplant patient, think of TB in your differential. The only way to diagnose active TB is with stains and cultures. You, you can't use any of these. You can't use a PPD or any, any other test to diagnose this. On the right, this is our fluorochrome stain that we use. The patient coughs up some sputum. The lab processes it by using something to get rid of the mucus, to lyse the mucus. They then centrifuge it to concentrate it and put this fluorescent stain, this fluorochrome stain. That allows them, if there's barely a few bacteria in there, they can screen multiple fields with their microscope. And these things light up. They fluoresce. It makes it very easy for them to see just a few bacteria. You can see some nonspecific, um, in patients with TB, some nonspecific laboratory findings, things like anemia, hypobuminemia. 
Um, having seen transplant patients, this is extremely common. Mild leukocytosis. Hypercalcemia can occur because these activated macrophages convert vitamin D to its active 125 form. Um, in patients with disseminated TB, they may have marrow involvement leading to pancytopenia. And if, again, if the liver is infiltrated, uh, elevated alkaline phosphatase is the usual finding. Okay, so we got a question about quantiferon. So we have three tests that we can use to look for cell-mediated immune response to tuberculosis. To my knowledge, of all of our other lab testing, it's based on antibody responses and detecting the organism itself. These are the only tests I'm aware of that look at cell-mediated immunity. The PPD, uh, quantiferon, and T-spot TB, the quantiferon and T-spot TB are known as interferon gamma release assays. And so we'll talk about those in a minute. All three of these tests give you no information about whether the patient has active or latent tuberculosis. Um, so you can see it in both. Active tuberculosis, again, we're saying that the reason the patient has developed active tuberculosis is because of a failure of the immune system to control this infection. And so it's not surprising that you would see patients with active TB who have negative tests. Um, so bear that in mind. If you think someone has active TB, don't hang your hat on one of these tests. And then all have reduced sensitivity in immunocompromised. Um, again, you're testing T cell response, and so your transplant patients are going to have less of that. The PPD, um, also called MANTU or tuberculose, uh, tuberculin skin test, the, the protein is manufactured. They take tuberculosis. They extract this protein from it. You have to inject it intradermally, which is very superficial. So you can see this wheel is being raised here. And then after injecting that tuberculin, 48 to 72 hours later, you measure it. Now, there's some erythema in this picture. It's hard to take a picture of induration, but all you care about is induration. You, you don't care about erythema. So if you get a big spot of erythema, that's not a positive test. You want to be able to feel the induration. Um, PPD is, from a biological standpoint, a very good test. Um, it has a lot of logistical problems. So this, actually, it's a logistical nightmare. Um, we've just seen a lot of false positives and false negatives for various reasons. Um, when you place it, you've got to get your patient to come back 48 to 72 hours later. That in itself is a problem for a referral center where somebody may have come from six hours away. The intradermal injection can be done wrong. Uh, so if, if this is injected subcutaneously, you'll, you as a clinician will probably never know and they'll just get a false negative. Um, the, the other things that I've seen happen in some worst case scenarios, embarrassing story to tell. I had a patient who had a PPD, and when I, I had some question about it, and so I asked the nurse, did this patient actually come back? And uh, the, the nurse said, no, uh, we called the patient at home and asked if the PPD was positive. Um, so it, it's just really hard to get these things done right. In response to that, we have the interferon gamma release assays that take care of a lot of these logistical problems, but essentially give the same information. The one that we have here at, at University Hospital is the quantiferon gold. What happens is you draw blood into three different tubes. The tubes contain a nil antigen, which is a negative control, TB antigen, um, which is the tuberculosis antigen that you care about, and mitogen, which is a positive control. These tubes are incubated at body temperature, 37 Celsius, for 16 hours. And then the interferon gamma in each tube is released. Now remember, your, your T helper lymphocytes, when they recognize tuberculosis antigen being presented on MHC class 2 by the macrophage, secrete interferon gamma to activate the um, macrophage to kill it. And so this is the response that you're measuring. Here are what your results are going to look like. So this is a negative test. You have the negative control is negative, the positive control is positive, and the TB is, is negative. So that's a valid negative test. Here's a positive test. The TB is positive, negative control negative, and positive control positive. OK, so negative and positive, pretty easy to understand. These are the ones that I get tons and tons of questions about, the indeterminate. So this patient had no response to negative control but no response to positive control and no response to TB. So 
This could mean a couple of things. Either the test was done wrong, if you, if you incubate it at the wrong temperature, um, if you shake the tubes too hard, that can kill the, the lymphocytes. Uh, there's a variety of ways to screw this up, but basically it could be that the processing was bad. And so your first step is gonna be just to send the test again and see if you get a valid result. The other possibility is that your patient doesn't have any lymphocytes. So if your patient's lymphopenic or doesn't have functional lymphocytes, then you won't have interferon gamma released even with the positive control. Um, when I look at this, this is a huge advantage of the interferon gamma release assays. If you do a PPD on a lymphopenic patient, you will get a negative result. And you won't, you won't be any wiser. At least when you get this indeterminate, you know that you don't have um, an immune response. And so your test, if it's negative, it's a false negative on the PPD. Or it's potentially a false negative. Um, Okay, so again, indeterminate gives no information about the presence or absence of TB. It's a failure of one of these controls. It means your test is not valid. There's no such thing as an intermediate result. So if you see the indeterminate, that doesn't mean that your patient has TB. You basically have, have gained no information from before you did the test. T-spot TB, I don't want to spend a long time talking about, basically because we don't have it here. It's a very similar assay. It is interferon gamma release based. It does have an additional, it has actually a lot of differences about it in the way it's processed, although the end result is the same. Um, in this test, rather than using whole blood, they actually will take out the lymphocytes, count them at the beginning of the test. And so for lymphopenic patients, this test has better sensitivity because they make sure you've got some lymphocytes to actually respond. From a meta-analysis, what we get is the sensitivities look pretty similar. Um, T-spot does seem to come out ahead, and this is particularly true in immunocompromised patients. Quantiferon and, and tuberculin skin test, 80%. T-spot TB, 90%. Again, these are estimates. These are not based on huge volumes of data. Um, in terms of specificity, they're all pretty good, with the exception of tuberculin skin test. One of the big downfalls of this is that BCG does give you a, pos a false positive um, Tuberculose, uh, tuberculin skin test. So in your patients that are from Mexico, they were probably vaccinated with BCG as a child, and their positive PPD could be a false positive. In unvaccinated patients, so that would be anybody from the United States who, who hasn't lived outside the country, the specificity of PPD is similar to the others. Um, so I hope that, just, just to say, does that clear up any questions you all have about quantifiron? Um, um, there, so I don't know, I don't know if anyone here knows what the cost is. They're, they're definitely more expensive than PPD, um, but I think a lot of the logistical problems, the, the difficulties, the extra clinic visits and extra lab draws and things that can come from um, the logistical problems might make up for it. I don't know that for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Yes. Should we be doing both a PPD and a quantifier on all these patients that were so, going to immunosuppress? So that, that's a good question. The question is whether, whether to do both. Um, so it, it is a bit awkward when somebody does both because there is no guidance anywhere about what it means when you have uh, discordance. So for me, if I'm in clinic seeing a pre-transplant patient who has one positive and one negative, um, and this is, this is not evidence-based, this is just my opinion. I'll try to figure out if they're, quanti uh, I'm sorry, if they're BCG vaccinated. If they're BCG vaccinated and they have a positive PPD and negative quantifiron, I will call that a false positive from BCG. If it's vice versa, um, nobody really knows what to do, and I would probably err on the side of treating those patients for latent tuberculosis. But, but yeah, the, the CDC, when you look, even says um, if you do both and they don't agree, <coughs> then nobody has any idea what that means. So I'll say, I mean, my opinion would be that the, if you're going to do the interferon gamma release assay, I think that one has some advantages. I would probably stick with that one alone. Um, if you do both, like I said, if, if, one comes, if either one comes back positive pre-transplant, I'll probably elect to treat them in most cases.
you say a word about the natural history of PPD? Does it fade away if you if your immune system is there? If if your immune system is there, it's it's not supposed to fade away. So in patients that have had remote, you know, they were 30 years ago treated for tuberculosis, they should still have a PPD. Um, there's certainly interest in, you know, again, looking at these quantifieron results, there's interest in whether these, this is not a positive. If we look at a positive, you actually get a quantitative result for the TB antigen. There's interest in whether that, you know, change in the number could, could mean something, but so far there's nothing reliable on that. So yeah, PPD should stay positive for life. Um, you're right that when it reverts to negative, oftentimes it would be if we, if we immunosuppress our patients, they'll fail to have any kind of response. So if someone has a history of a positive PPD in the past and they were treated for six to 12 months in the past, what needs to be done diagnostically to evaluate them? Okay, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So, so if they had treated TB or treated latent TB, either one, we expect their, their quantifieron and their PPD to remain positive. What I do with them, and I think what most people would do, um, is now you don't have that as a useful piece of information anymore. And so I'll get them in and do a careful history to see if they have any high-risk exposures. And I actually have had that happen. I had somebody who was treated for TB um, and then got an organ transplant. After they got their organ transplant, they took care of their uncle who had TB. Um, and then they were sent to my clinic with what to do to get a second organ transplant. And so I ended up treating that patient based on their history of exposure. And I think that's all you can do is, is a history to see if they've been exposed. If they have been exposed and they're gonna be transplanted, I would treat them. Um, you know, post-transplant, what do you do with that? I, I guess in theory they should be, if they're in a high risk exposure, they should be um, contacted by the public health department and prophylaxed at that point. So if they're asymptomatic, you assume the treatment worked in the past? Assuming they haven't had any exposure? Yes. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's nothing else that you can do in that situation. Uh, you, you know, again, a patient who's been treated in the past, has lived in the United States, and, and doesn't have any of those risk factors, the likelihood that they've been exposed to TB is extremely low. Um, and so I don't think it's warranted to prophylax everyone in whom you can't get that result. See, so yeah, I think we... So if you have a patient that was treated in the past and then, and it's pre-transplant and they have come back positive and potentially could have, since we do have patients that we start with to Mexico, we should go ahead and do <coughs> that over the unit? Yes. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, travel to Mexico, if they went to Cancun for a weekend, you know, that's not much. Um, I, I'll be happy to try and sort that out, but it's, you know, some of it is going to come down to guesswork. If they went to Cancun for the weekend, I'm probably going to let them go. Um, if they, you know, if they went to take care of their uncle who's coughing for six months in Mexico, I'm probably going to treat them. And in between, it's, I guess it's a coin toss or judgment call. Okay, is that the charge master price? Yes. Okay, but it sounds like it sounds like insurance is covering yeah. them. I pay for it. I know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, and to say what I do in clinic when I get some indeterminate. So the first indeterminate, I'll repeat. Um, there, there was a problem a few months ago with quantifierons, and they were all coming back indeterminate. Um, that's been taken care of now, but if I get a second indeterminate, what I'll do is send them for T-spot TB, and we're looking in to see if we can get that here. And I've had some success with that, at least in um, non-transplant patients. I've had at least one who had two indeterminates come back with a valid T-spot result. Okay, so uh, are transplant patients at higher risk for TB, and how much? This is a question. So again, the reason we're asking is that if you have latent tuberculosis and you're put on these um, medicines that target T cells, then you would expect that you're going to have reactivation. And similarly, if you're exposed, your, your chance of containing that infection when you're on immunosuppressive medications is going to be lower. The best study I could find is this Resitra. Um, it's a prospective cohort. 
And this is from Spain. There were 4,388 solid organ transplant patients. These were liver, lung, kidney, and it's multi-center. So how many of them, basically they were looking to see how many of them got tuberculosis. Um, their rate was 0.5% per year, so they had um, 512, I believe, out of 4,388. Uh, I'm sorry, 512 is per 100,000, or 0.5%. And then in their general population, the rate was 19 per 100,000 per year. So about 25 times as likely to get tuberculosis if you're a post-transplant patient. Uh, interestingly, for comparison, we have a lot less than Spain does here in the United States. We have about 2.9%. And Texas is maybe double the national um, incidence at 4.7. There is county level data, and Bear County is right here at about 5 per 100,000, just like the rest of Texas. Um, so basically, the answer is yes, there's a lot more tuberculosis in transplant patients. Um, so in patients that have a positive PPD or quantiferon who end up undergoing transplantation, what is the risk and how does this change with isoniazid? And again, this, this Spanish study was probably the best that I could find to address this. Um, we had had some questions about what is latent tuberculosis, and it's a little bit tricky. The biological definition, you'd want to say it's anyone who has live tuberculosis in granulomas in their body, um, but we don't really have a... 100% reliable tests, and one of the tricky things about latent tuberculosis is there's no gold standard. So if you wanted to see how well your PPD works, there's really nothing that you can do to try and confirm or rule it out. Um, you know, I guess if you think biologically, the only way that you would be able to do that is to take the lung and really every organ and, and check it for TB pathologically, you know, culture it. Um, so our clinical definition tends to be anybody with a positive test, either PPD or interferon gamma release, and they don't have active disease and they've not been treated. So we would call all of those latent tuberculosis. Now, one of our, I guess, you know, kind of behind the scenes secrets is this really leaves, leaves us open for, I mean, you can easily imagine a scenario where somebody was treated and they just didn't understand it. Um, and so they would be classified as having latent tuberculosis. Um, more worrisome than that is there probably are some people who are exposed to tuberculosis and clear it completely, and they may end up with positive PPDs or quantiferon. Of course, we have no way to tease that out. And so clinically, if you have a positive test, then you have latent TB. In immunocompetent patients, we know that if you have one of these positive tests and you're classified as having latent TB, you have about a 10% risk of reactivation. Um, this is based on studies where people are exposed and convert their PPD to positive, about 5% will develop active TB within the first couple of years of exposure. So for our patients who were screening, and we could, we could kind of assume that their positive test is old, then we're probably left with this other 5% later in life. So total of 10%, 5% after exposure, and 5% at some time later. And that's assuming that people remain healthy. Um, in healthy patients, randomized controlled trials have shown that isoniazid is effective at preventing disease. Um, so again, looking at this Spanish study, they did look at PPD status. In patients that had a positive PPD, their risk of active TB was 864 per 100,000, so about 0.8% per year, <coughs> excuse me, um, which really is not exceedingly high, about close to 1%. And then those who are PPD negative, much lower risk, 0.2 uh, per year, 0.2%. They found in this study that the relative risk was four if you had a positive test. In this case, all these were PPDs. The study was done in 1998. Um, but this was not statistically significant. Um, so just to say the reason is there were so few patients with TB. Even among 4,000 transplant patients, they on only ended up with 21 patients, and so they weren't able to show a statistically significant difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, of those 338 patients with a positive PPD, 147 were treated with isoniazid, which I thought was interesting that they you know, went to the trouble to do these PPDs, but then um, the majority of them were actually not treated. I don't know if this is really legible, but these are the 21 cases among those 4,000 transplant patients. And so if you look here, you can see that 
the majority did not have a PPD done. Out of 21, it looks like there were six patients who had a PPD done. Three were positive and three were negative. Um, so, so just the majority not getting a PPD, and of those who got it, um, again, of these three positive patients, only um, one of those was treated. Okay, so just to say isoniazid treatment of latent TB in pre-transplant patients, we think this is a good strategy based on our understanding of the biology, but um, there's no randomized controlled trials to tell us how well this works. If you think about it, you would really just have to do an enormous trial to get any useful data because you're going to, you know, your outcome is going to be tuberculosis in these patients, um, which really isn't that common. Case series and observational studies, um, case control studies, suggest that this is effective. Um, the thing that we worry about, like in the case we presented, we have a cirrhotic patient with abnormal LFTs, is hepatotoxicity from isoniazid, which is the drug that we commonly use to treat latent tuberculosis. If you look at healthy patients, there are minor LFT elevations in about 20%, so fairly common to happen, but rarely do you have to discontinue the drug because of it. Hepatitis is about 1 to 3 per 1,000, and that means um, larger elevations of LFTs and symptoms, and that looks very clinically like uh, acute viral hepatitis when it happens. Risk factors for developing hepatitis alcohol um, is a huge one. So when you look at, at cases where people have had um, fulminant hepatotoxicity from isoniazid, many of them have, have drank alcohol. Um, additional hepatotoxic meds is something, of course, we deal with in um, patients that are post-transplant. Um, increasing age is a big risk factor for hepatotoxicity. And then there's conflicting evidence on viral hepatitis. Um, some studies have shown that they're that they, you know, you probably do worse if you have viral hepatitis, and some have said no, there's no impact. Um, so if we think about active TB and transplant, how does it present and how does that compare with the general population? The majority of cases of active TB occur within the first year, and if you think about this as being most likely reactivation of disease that's being unmasked by immunosuppression, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Median, median time to onset is about three to six months after transplant in these series. Immunocompetent patients, um, the majority of them have pulmonary TB. They can have disseminated or extrapulmonary TB. Um, to, to be clear, extrapulmonary TB is any organ system outside the lungs, and you can have, you can have isolated organ involvement such as renal tuberculosis with nothing else, um, CNS tuberculosis with nothing else, lymphadenitis. Um, and that's a distinct entity from disseminated tuberculosis where essentially every organ is involved. So immunocompetent patients will typically have pulmonary TB. I'd say anecdotally it's at least 90%, if not more, of patients that we see are going to have pulmonary. We often look for extra pulmonary TB and rarely find it in the hospital. We see plenty of patients where we look for pulmonary TB, and many times we do find it. Um, they will typically prevent, present with cavitary disease. Whereas transplant patients, much, many more of them have extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Um, and although the majority still does have pulmonary TB, few of them present with cavitary disease. They'll typically come in with infiltrates, miliary pattern, or nodules. Um, so, so again, when you see your transplant patient, you're suspecting TB, don't count on the, the cavity diagnostically. Any infiltrate or any um, x-ray abnormality that you see could be tuberculosis. Just a word about treating active TB. Um, we use the standard therapy, RIPE therapy, uh, rifampin, isoniazid, PZA, and ethambutol. These medicines have a lot of interactions. Rifampin is a CYP, um, I believe, strong inhibitor. And so you get a lot of inducer. Uh, OK, the pharmacist set me straight on that. It's an inducer. So th that brings me to get help from pharmacists. <laughs> since you. <laughs> Since you've only prescribed this drug a million times and don't know if it's an inducer or inhibitor. Um, now, interestingly, immunosuppression, this is, this is something that's maybe counterintuitive. A lot of the damage and necrosis that comes from active tuberculosis is because of the immune response. And the immune response actually tends to be detrimental. Um, even in healthy patients, what we'll sometimes see is they come in with cavitary disease or disease particularly. Um, so patients with tuberculous meningitis alone when you treat them, they get much worse because of the 
dying organisms eliciting an immune response and el eliciting inflammation. And so TB meningitis, when we treat that in healthy patients, we actually have to give them steroids to blunt the inflammatory response. Um, general, you know, regular patients with pulmonary tuberculosis sometimes will worsen with the onset of treatment. Again, these dying organisms, antigen is exposed, and you have this brisk inflammatory response. The bottom line with that is that probably when you are treating a uh, transplant patient, this is one where you shouldn't decrease their immunosuppression because that will make the Im immune reconstitution. So this iris um, is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. That'll make it worse. So leave the immunosuppression where it is. Um, and finally, hepatotoxicity is a big problem. Uh, rifampin, isoniazid, and to some extent PZA can cause this. And, and the combination is worse than any of them alone. Up to 40% of liver transplant patients will have hepatotoxicity from these meds. So one thing that I wanted to talk about is N-acetylcysteine. Um, these hepatotoxic medications, some folks have tried to use N-acetylcysteine to prevent this liver toxicity. And there's a single randomized controlled trial that shows that this worked really well. Um, these are healthy patients age 60 or above who are treated with RIPE therapy. And, and again, when you look at the hepatotoxicity, older patients get more hepatotoxicity. So this is a setup for people who are going to get problems with it. It was open label. They gave the control group nothing. They gave the intervention group N-acetylcysteine. Of 32 patients that were given, um, so, so actually this, this is an incorrect slide. This is reversed. The control group had 12 of 32 patients with hepatotoxicity, or 37.5%. And the intervention group, N-acetylcysteine, none of 28 patients got hepatotoxicity. These are the patient's LFT. So group one is N-acetylcysteine. Um, again, this is reversed. I apologize for that. I didn't go over this slide carefully. So this is actually the control. At baseline, average AST and ALT were 27 and 22. In the control group, those went up to 99 and 65 on average. In the intervention group, this is at week one. In the intervention group with N-acetylcysteine, there was no real change in the LFTs at week one. And these asterisks, so the bilirubin was statistically significantly higher at a p-value of less than 0.01 in the control group compared with N-acetylcysteine group. And again, I apologize for the, for the slide. I don't know why the um, authors chose to call it group one and group two instead of control and intervention. OK, so just to say, when you see a single small randomized control trial, you get excited. Um, sometimes when you try to confirm it, it ends up being complete hogwash. So who knows whether that actually works. But N-acetylcysteine is cheap and doesn't really have any side effects other than it's kind of nasty. It, it, it gives people a bad taste. Um, so I've occasionally done this, whether it works or not, not completely sure. Um, OK, so what happens to patients with tuberculosis who are transplant patients? Um, yeah, so they, they do poorly. Prior studies have shown a 29% mortality. That study was published in uh, 1998 and was based on um, much older data. So risk factors for mortality, disseminated infection, organ rejection, and the use of this OKT3 or anti-T cell antibodies. Those are all risk factors for mortality. In newer studies, the mortality is closer to 10%. And if we look back again at this Spanish study, so these are OK, so 4,000 patients of those, 21 got tuberculosis. And there were, so here are four deaths. The four deaths among these 21 patients, two of them were deemed, my laser is dying, two of them were deemed to be related to tuberculosis. Oh, OK. And two were unrelated to tuberculosis. Um, so actually, 10% mortality. And I don't know if that, does that gel with what you all have been here a while have seen? So, so the, we've had four cases and they all died. So 100%. <laughs> That's what treatments okay. do. And, and those are, so those are livers. What about, have you guys seen any in, re, in renal or lung? Um, okay. Okay. So back to our case. Um, we remember the case. We, we determined, again, based on the CT chest showing stable nodules over many months that this is latent tuberculosis. Um, these are the options that I'm usually left with in clinic. We could try treating now with isoniazid. Um, 
I, now this, this is generally what I do in clinic. So I take these patients, and even though their LFTs are abnormal to begin with, I put them on isoniazid. Um, my experience has been that they all do fine. I've had to discontinue a few courses of therapy, and in many cases, when I've discontinued, it's very sketchy. So the guidelines are that if their LFTs are above three times upper limit of normal with symptoms, that they should be discontinued. So my patients come in and they say, I don't feel good, and my back hurts a little bit, and so I kind of say, well, based on the risk versus benefits, I'm going to stop your therapy, um, but it's doubtful whether they actually have hepatotoxicity. Um, I, I do, when their LFTs are abnormal at baseline, I carefully monitor them. And probably the most important thing is that I tell them that if they feel bad, they need to stop their isoniazid. And it's, it's amazing how, um, how few people actually do that. I guess it's because they don't feel that bad. Um, but many patients I've seen, I've told them, if you get any little symptoms, stop taking your isoniazid. They'll come back a few months later and they'll say, well, my belly started hurting real bad, but I just, I just kept going. Um, so in acetylcysteine, you know, maybe that helps. I've had, when I've had patients that get towards the limit, I've sometimes used it. Um, I won't report anecdotes since it's probably not useful. Um, the other option that you really have is just forget about this, wait till they're transplanted, wait till their liver function, if it's a liver um, patient, returns to normal. Just to say that the kidneys and lungs, usually their livers are okay, and so they're much easier to treat. Um, but when it's a liver transplant, you could just transplant them when the graft starts working, treat them at that point. And finally, of course, the option is forget about it. Um, this came up recently in a patient that needed hepatitis C treatment. And my uh, hepatitis C treating colleague said, can you just not treat the latent TB right now? Of course, I was itching to treat it. Um, but it ends up the TB risk is probably about 1% per year. And the risk of mortality base, not on our experience, but on the Spanish study, is maybe 0.1%. So it probably isn't a good idea to do routinely, but if in isolated cases you decide not to treat, um, the odds are with you. So that's what I have. I'll be happy to take um, any questions or comments. So Anthony, regarding treatment, yeah. um, there have been times when isoniazid wasn't in favor for some of these uh, liver patients, and they tried all manner of other things. Uh, mm -hmm. Fluoroquinolones, uh, ethamutol plus ribavirin, or uh, rifampin. Yeah. So, so, any of those things actually 